Hello and welcome to Principles of Microeconomic Theory with me, Dr. Craig Webb. This week we'll be looking at demand, supply and the idea of an equilibrium. This video is about demand, so let's get started. When we talk about the quantity demanded in microeconomics, we mean the amount of a good that consumers are willing to purchase. This might not be the same as the amount that they do actually purchase, because what is available may be restricted in some way. Their demand is what they would be willing to purchase if it were available. Now, demand is going to be affected by many things. Consider a consumer's demand for coffee will denote this quantity capital Q. And let's think about the factors that might affect demand. First and foremost, the price of coffee is going to be central. Also, the consumer's income, denoted capital Y, which is how much they can spend, clearly has a role. What about other goods? Perhaps the price of sugar, which is a complement, something the consumer enjoys with their coffee. There are many other factors, the price of substitutes, perhaps tea or hot chocolate, government regulations, the time of year, and more generally, just the consumer's tastes. We'll keep it simple and focus just on the price of coffee, the price of sugar, and the consumer's income. To analyse consumer demand, we need a way to model it which means describe mathematically the relationship between these particular variables and the consumer's demand. To do this, we use the idea of a demand function. So we'll write that Q, the quantity of coffee demanded, is some function, capital D, of the price of coffee, the price of sugar, and the consumer's income. So if we plug these values into the demand function D, out pops the quantity demanded. This idea extends to the case where there are many goods, and it's common in microeconomic theory to think of demand as a function of the prices of all goods and the consumer's income. For the demand function for coffee, we haven't specified a functional form, so this is very general at the moment. We can in fact learn quite a lot by keeping things as general as possible, but it's often convenient to work with special cases, for example, linear demand functions. In this case, we could write Q is equal to A minus B times the price of coffee minus C times the price of sugar plus D times the consumer's income, where A, B, C and D are all positive numbers, the parameters of this demand function. Don't be put off by the simplicity here. Linear approximations are often very useful. For example, to say that a function is differentiable or smooth means precisely that it can be very well approximated locally by a linear function. For a more concrete example, we all know, unless we are in extreme denial, that we live on a planet that is essentially spherical, but in our day-to-day -day lives we simply assume that the ground is flat and it works perfectly well. The same idea goes for demand functions. If we're considering prices in a relatively small range, linear works great. To consider prices from zero to, say, a million, well, then we might have to think a bit more. Let's have a look at the signs of these parameters. This positive sign here means that changes in the demand for coffee are positively related to changes in the consumer's income. So this consumer will demand more coffee if they get more income. Seems reasonable, although this is just an assumption to bring to the data, and each consumer may be different. This minus sign means that changes in the demand for coffee are negatively related to changes in the price of sugar, capturing the idea that these goods are complements. If sugar becomes more expensive, and the consumer enjoys sugar with their coffee, well then the consumer may demand less coffee. This minus sign means that changes in the demand for coffee are negatively related to changes in the price of coffee. So if the price goes up and everything else stays constant, then demand goes down. This is in accordance with something called the law of demand, which claims that changes in demand are negatively related to changes in a good's own price, holding everything else constant. To express this conveniently in mathematical notation, we can write that the partial derivative of demand with respect to the goods price is negative. Perhaps you haven't seen a partial derivative before, so let's explain that notation. I do assume that you've seen derivatives for single variable functions before. For instance, if y is a function of x, so if I write y is equal to 3x squared, 
then you should know that the derivative denoted dy over dx is equal to 6x. We assume that the demand for coffee is a function of three variables, so how do we handle that? Although there is much to learn about extending calculus to the many variable case, this is the basic idea. Suppose z is a function of two variables x and y, something like z equals 3x squared plus y cubed plus x times y. Well, to partially differentiate z with respect to x, we simply treat y as a constant. So we get the partial derivative of z with respect to x is equal to 6x plus y. Because we're taking y as a constant when we take this partial derivative, the derivative of the y cubed term is simply zero, and so it disappears from this expression. This curly d notation just reminds us that z is a function of other variables too, and that we're fixing those as we take this partial derivative. To partially differentiate z with respect to y, we just treat x as a constant, and we get the partial derivative of z with respect to y is equal to 3y squared plus x. Perhaps pause the video and double check that this makes sense. We'll see partial derivatives a lot more in the course, and I'll explain as we go. Coming back to the law of demand, we now understand what this expression means. Now, the law of demand is something we typically expect to hold, but there's nothing especially wrong with violating this so-called law. Later in the course, we'll learn a lot more about this. Goods that do violate this law, so goods where price increases lead to higher demand, are called Giffen goods, after the 19th century economist Sir Robert Giffen. It was suggested that during the Irish potato famine, because potatoes were such a large staple of the diet, and because such a high proportion of people's income was spent on potatoes, that when the price of potatoes went up, they simply stopped buying other goods and so spent the remaining money on more potatoes. However, the evidence has not really supported this hypothesis, but still we name such goods after Giffen. The search for real-life examples actually took a long time. This relatively recent article, Giffen Behaviour and Subsistence Consumption, is from 2008 in a journal called the American Economic Review. This is the world's leading journal in economics, and here I've highlighted that this paper provides the first real-world evidence of Giffen behaviour. So it took more than a hundred years after Giffen suggested the idea for the first real-world evidence to be seen. In short, these types of goods are very rare, and in the overwhelming majority of cases, we will observe the law of demand being satisfied. So let's get back to our linear demand function. Now, if we use techniques from econometrics, we can estimate the values of these parameters A, B, C and D by using real-world data. And let's assume that we've been given these parameter values and our best estimate is that the demand function is Q, the demand for coffee, is equal to 8.56 minus the price of coffee minus 0.3 times the price of sugar plus 0.1 times the consumer's income. So, how can we work with this to analyse microeconomic problems? For this purpose, it is useful to express the demand function graphically to produce diagrams of demand functions. Even though the demand function we're working with here seems very simple, notice that there are four dimensions. Now, I can't draw four-dimensional diagrams, so how do we do this? Essentially, because we're mainly interested in the relationship between demand and price, we will fix the values of the other variables for now. So, let the price of sugar equal 20 cents, 0.2 of a dollar, and let income equal 35. Then the demand function simplifies to Q equals 12 minus P. And so producing a diagram should be straightforward. There's one caveat to this. I assume that you know that when producing graphs of functions, if I told you that y was a function of x, you would know to draw x on the horizontal axis and y on the vertical axis. Now here we have demand as a function of price. And so you'd think price goes on the horizontal 
and demand goes on the vertical. Unfortunately, in microeconomics, we draw these particular diagrams the wrong way round. Price goes on the vertical axis, demand goes on the horizontal axis. This is a consequence of history, really. The early works in microeconomics by Alfred Marshall and others assumed that demand determines the price and so drew the diagrams this way round. The convention of drawing this way has stuck. So, to draw the demand function, we need to invert it. In this case, this is quite simple. Rearranging the demand function to get price by itself on the left-hand side, we see that P equals 12 minus Q. This is called inverse demand, and it's what we're really drawing when doing diagrams of demand functions. This representation of a demand function is called a demand curve, even though in this case it's just a straight line. Remember, read these diagrams the wrong way. So, if the price is 9, then demand is 3. If the price is 6, then demand is 6. So we're taking the price as given and reading off what demand is. Notice that as the price changes, the quantity demanded by the consumer changes, but the demand curve that we've drawn stays put. We call this a movement along the demand curve. Now we've been discussing how a consumer responds to price changes and it's reasonable to ask at this point, where is this price coming from? We won't really answer that just yet. It's just something that the consumers will observe. You could think of it being determined by some fictional character, the so-called Valrasian auctioneer or the invisible hand of the market. However it's determined, consumers simply observe the price and respond. To produce this demand curve, we've assumed that the price of coffee is the only variable and shown how changes in the price of coffee cause movements along the demand curve. To do this, we took the price of sugar and the consumer's income as fixed. Of course, these are not necessarily fixed. And so, what happens to this demand curve when, for example, the consumer's income changes? Well, let's suppose that income increases from 35 to 50. Then we can produce a new demand curve using the same idea as before, but plugging in 50 instead of 35. The new demand function is Q equals 13.5 minus P, and inverting this gives the price is equal to 13.5 minus demand. And we see that the intercept term has increased from 12 to 13.5, and the slope, which is minus 1, hasn't changed. The new demand curve, D prime, looks like this. Notice that the consumer's demand has now increased at every price level. For example, if the price is 6, then the consumer now demands 7.5 instead of 6. This is not a movement along the demand curve, it's something else. We call this a shift in demand. So, changes in price cause movements along the demand curve, changes in other variables cause a shift of the demand curve. Thanks for watching and take care.